This is actually a marathon and not a sprint. In order to succeed in, in starting a company, especially in a startup, you, you have to be very resilient. You shouldn't be doing things that you say, okay, I'll do this now and after that I won't. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to HackCast, season four of HackCast. The podcast is already catching up speed, and we are currently recording the third episode. By the time of recording, the first episode of the fourth season already aired, and we received a lot of positive feedback, and we hope you will continue enjoying the content that we're going to provide. Here today, we have uh, we have the great honor and pleasure to have Miro Nedjalkov. Thanks for inviting me, guys. <laughs> who, is, uh, who is the co-founder and also the chief architect of Office R&D. And Office R&D is one of the Bulgarian startups that are that we, uh, as a collective, we are really, really proud of because it was one of the first start startups to actually grow big and continue growing and continue developing. So uh, thanks for being here with us, Miro. Thanks for having me. It's uh, it's a pleasure. It's it's a pleasure for us too. Ivo, how are you? Hey, I'm pretty good. And I'm speaking louder. Yeah, he is speaking louder. Right. <laughs> so we're, we're going to have level sounds. Yeah. And uh, today with Miro, we're going to talk about uh, being a technical... What, what does it mean to be a technical co-founder? And we're going to uh, touch upon a lot of topics that uh, Miro has get, gained experience uh, while working uh, in Office R&D. So let's start with this, Miro. Tell us a little, a little bit more about yourself and more about Office R&D. And we'll take it from there. Right. Uh, so, first of all, I'll start with this that I'm a pretty much technical guy. I've always uh, liked creating software, hacking some things here and there, and, you know, uh, understanding complicated systems and making them work better and serve purpose, um, a bigger one. So, uh, I, I've been a developer for like almost 20 years now. So, it's, oh, it's wow. been, yeah, it's been a long time. Again, we are not old. We just started young, so yeah. we are still pretty, pretty young. Right. All, all, all three of us. Oh well, I have some white beard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's it's been a while, uh, and I, I've always uh, liked creating stuff. And uh, like almost nine years ago, to be honest, it's it's almost nine years since we started off yeah. R&D. Uh, when Miro came to me and said, "Hey, let's let's start a business," I was. Uh, but then we'll need to do other things, not <laughs> And he was, yeah, but we'll be creating new stuff, you know. It's gonna be, it's gonna be exciting, and there will be a lot of code to be done. Uh, so I kind of were weren't sure that that's the right journey for me. But uh, after all this time, I I'm not sorry about this choice, and it's been it's been a wild uh, journey. Turns out it was a good uh, it was a good choice. Yeah, yeah while I was researching, uh, I was uh, I thought it was eight years, but you, you say nine years. So nine years ago, you and the other Miro, also known as Miro and Miro, <laughs> yeah, uh, you, you decided to start uh, you decided to start Office R and D, and we actually uh, we actually have quite a lot of history with Miro and Miro and Office R and D because I remember that they were uh, using our Hack Bulgaria's lecture hall as a co working <laughs> space. Do you remember this, Ivo? That was like nine years ago. <laughs> Some, something like this, nine nine or, or eight years ago. It, it was 2015, uh, but we've actually started uh, coding some bits and pieces of the software uh, on my kitchen table, <laughs> 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 like 2014. So, yeah, it's it's been a while. It's yeah, been, it's been a, while. a while. But I remember the times when we've been working on, on your... Uh, uh, in in your uh, the lecture hall, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was quite fun because you've been teaching uh, young uh, developers uh, how to code, <laughs> and we've been teaching ourselves how to be make business. <laughs> so it was very, you know, it yeah, was it, nice. it, it, it was good times. I, I remember uh, like one evening. Uh, uh, you and I, we were discussing some Haskell stuff on the on the on the whiteboard. This I have a very very like vivid memory memory of this. Uh, I don't know why, but uh, we, we we no longer do Haskell. But I, I remember this because we we both like technology and uh, like interesting concepts like uh, functional programming and stuff yeah. like that. And uh, by this time, I've been very excited uh, excited about functional programming. Now everybody is actually. Yeah. But yeah. back then, it wasn't that mainstream. <laughs> it wasn't that mainstream. Now, now, now we can say it is for sure. Yeah. And uh, also, uh, the M Miro. I think uh, the the other Miro was 
like very key to recommending us our first big client to for Hacksoft while uh, you both were working at like the lecture hall. I remember that he introduced us to John. Yeah. And after this, we started working uh, with uh, the collective and it was actually our first big client and this helped us eventually become a, 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 a proper company that we are right now. So Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's nice. Uh, yeah, I remember uh, us meeting with the collective and it was so scary. They wanted so many things and we've been speaking with Miro. Those guys, they don't need uh, off-the-shelf uh, SaaS solution. They need uh, somebody to develop stuff for them. Yeah. And yeah, then we decided to 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 speak with you and to refer you to them. I I, I believe it was a very good cooperation. They were very happy with yeah. with this. It was, and we were learning along the way. It was it was great for 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 both parties because we yeah. were yeah it was it was great for for both parties. And uh, I think you you actually uh, we actually had the experience of working with with Miro and uh, Office R and D as a client of Hacksoft. I you were actually I running the teams. Team. Yeah, I yeah. was running a team for for uh, Office R&D like two or three times maybe. Just yeah. a great experience. I'm sure we are pain in the ass in this, uh, <laughs> in this respect, but it's good that it, it was fun for you. <laughs> it was, it was fun working on like platform that's being used daily by, by hundreds of people. Yeah, Th that, that's the great. I think, for, at least for me, that's the greatest joy of uh, developing software when someone is actually using this, the the software. Otherwise, you're just building something that you are clicking on it and you know how yeah. it works, and it's not 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 that fun. Mm, yeah, 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 yeah. I know that. I know that uh, pretty well. I've been working on some solutions that never uh, that uh, never been used by anybody, and when we started working on Office R and D, it was like the same. But at some point, we started onboarding customers and people started, you know, working with the platform every day and uh, they started contacting us and telling us, hey, this platform saves us so much time, but it could be even better if you do this, this and this. And it was it started picking up and things like that. It was super exciting and, uh, and it was uh, very, very demanding as well. Oh, yeah. Because when people use, use your platform, the, 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 this, this part, uh, it, it needs to be very... Uh, well written it, that it needs to be very stable and things like that but also you need to uh, respond quickly to the demands of the customer so it's both exciting and hard but it's fun yeah i remember i'm not sure who who said this but like the best way to prioritize what to develop next is to have clients Oh well, <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> Otherwise, you're just like uh, building stuff that you you don't you have no idea if it if it's going to work or not. But if you have clients and the clients are pushing you in in the right direction, then the priorities are pretty much pretty much set. Yeah, that's that's true to some to some point though, because when you when you have a little bit of customers, they're pushing you. And at some point, they're pushing you from all directions so you don't move a bit if you just wait for somebody to push you. So you have to lead and they have to follow. All right. But yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a very good thought, though, because when you don't have any customers, well, it's very hard to prioritize, I think. And you can spend a lot of time developing things. Yeah. Know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we've, we've built some things that nobody used. We think, still have some features like that. <laughs> we have to remove them. <laughs> I think everyone did at some point, like working on something that never got released or was released, but no, no one enjoyed. Yeah, as you speak about releases, <laughs> we release everything. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> all right. <laughs> we unrelease it at some point, but we, we release everything. I will write this down and we will get uh, to talk about uh, dev developers' ego and the things they create. Uh, but... <laughs> First, yeah, you are the chief architect of Office R and D. Yeah, what does it mean to be the chief architect? What what's what's the role of the chief architect? Let's let's start there. Do, do you know what's what's uh, even funnier? I've been asked by a lot of people inside the company because they they see me doing a lot of stuff that don't necessarily uh, meet the definition of an architect at all, mm. and that's probably my you know co-founder hat. When you're a co-founder, it's like you, you you feel that everything is your responsibility in, in a way. Uh, but I'm I'm trying to contain myself, to, to be honest. Uh, to be a chief architect means that you're responsible for like uh, the the whole software vision and the software stack and the, all the good practices, how the software 
is, uh, is, is made into pieces and how do those pieces interact to each other and things like that. Uh, w- what are the best solutions to solve all the small problems here and there? Like not the business logic problems, but the architectural problems, like the connection yeah, yeah. between the services and things like that. Uh, what uh, infrastructure... The bigger abstractions, basically. Not only the abstractions, but the solutions for those mm. abstractions. Because, mm. you know, when you build an abstraction, let's say you have deployment mm-hmm. and it's uh, h- how this service is deployed somewhere, but also... Uh, what is this somewhere, right? Yeah. Is it yeah. is it serverless? Is it is it uh, right. virtual machines? What what is? So all those things they are in the in the in my domain basically, and I work very closely with the CTO of the company. All right. Be, because he doesn't have the you know the time to do everything in in such detail, and I work very much much closer to the team as uh, than than he does. All so, right. But I'm I'm. Uh, to, if you if you imagine it this way, I'm part of the city office, so everything that is responsibility of the city office is my responsibility as well. But my my role here is to be much closer to the people that are doing the implementation, to work with them and to help them understand all of those, and not setting the great vision, you know, all right. like five years in the future. So more nitty gritty details around implementations. Uh, so do you still code? Of course. Oh, really? I, I, I wouldn't be able to live without coding. This is this is something that uh, I understood, understood uh, on my journey in Office R&D that I just don't feel good when I don't code. <laughs> All right. Uh, because in the beginning, when we started the company, of course, I've been the co- the technical co-founder. Yeah. Both with Miro, we've been developers, but we've decided you you take the business, I take the mm. uh, uh, the software part and the you know the the technology. Uh, and at some point, we've hired our CTO. Mm-hmm. Uh, he joined the company and we've been, okay, what would you like to do? And uh, I said, I would like to be a great manager. So I became the VP of engineering of Office R&D and he All became right. the CTO. And then I figured out it's not so exciting to be VP of engineering because you, you're not to, you're not allowed to touch any code, you know. Yeah. Your role there is to uh, work with engineers, hire engineers, fire engineers, uh, hire engineering managers, fire engineering managers. Yeah. This is not so exciting, you know. At least not for it was not exciting for you, uh, in the way you 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 uh, the way you feel ab- uh, about things. To, to, to be honest, I believe people find it. Uh, think about it; it's more exciting than it than actually it is. Yeah, there are of course some people that are natural managers. They care more about the uh, the processes and, uh, to, to make the team work in a, mm. in the best possible way, which is, which is great. I like working in teams that work, were great, but it's not exciting for me to, to actually make it happen. Uh, I've learned how to do it, but it's not, it, it's not super great for me. And then I figured I, I really feel much better when I have quality time thinking about code and software and technology then thinking about processes and how people should interact with each other. Of course, I love working with people. And that's why this role actually makes me very happy because it's both, uh, it has both interactions with people and also work with the, with the software and with the technology. And it's, it's amazing. It's the right amount of and, both. And yeah. I don't need to fire anybody, which is also <laughs> amazing. <laughs> oh, that's hard. Yeah, it's for sure. I'll follow up with some questions. So you you do coding. Yeah. Are you coding like features or, or bug fixes or whatever it needs to be? No. Proof of concepts, what? Yes. Proof of concepts. Uh, yeah, uh, features and bugs, I don't I don't code uh, because they, they require a lot of domain knowledge and you, after that you need to you know, properly support them. So that's that's something that we really believe should be done by a team. Okay. Because, you know, the team is more stable unit than a person. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I try to focus on uh, coding things that are like uh, making the way forward for people to, to come after that. And uh, one of those things are POCs, like you said. Mm. Others like... Uh, if uh, there need to be some technical solution for some specific problem, like how do we make uh, background task uh, handling? How do we do that? Like and different pieces of abstractions. Different pieces of, of abstractions. And infrastructure. infrastructure. Yeah, I'm, I'm also uh, as chief architect. I'm part of the city office. And uh, now the whole city office is actually a platform team as well. Platform engineering team. Okay. So what we do is we build a... Uh, platform to allow our developers to actually self-serve themselves. 
uh, in a variety of ways. And the yeah, piece of infrastructure as well. Of course, we try to not build them, but use software so as a service is, yeah. and platform as a service and just wrap it up in a in, a, in an abstraction so people can interact with it easily. All right, all right. So, so you do some DevOps work too. Try not to. Okay. <laughs> I I try to make like one level higher <laughs> work, so make automation that does DevOps work for me. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, so I try not to write Terraform, but to write Terraform templates that some automation creates Terraform out of them and create the actual t stuff with them. So it's yeah. Okay. What if something critical appears, like a bug or an emergency, a server is down? Do you? take care of this or there is other people that are taking care of this? That's a very good question. It depends on which system it, it happens. But usually we, we have this, we, we call call them SRE teams. Okay. It's not the actual SRE, but it got uh, uh, the, the SRE thing that happened in Google. Uh, I don't know if you know. Site Reliability Engineering, yes. SRE. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Rado. Yeah. Uh, so this was our inspiration to create this initiative in the company. But because we are not as big as Google, we, we couldn't have a dedicated team to do that. But we've, we've picked some engineers uh, that wanted to learn more and to extend their knowledge uh, and included them in, into a virtual uh, site reliability engineering team. Uh, and they're across all services and domains. And their duty is to, when the alarm rings, that something is wrong with the service, they go there and try to figure out and fix the problem themselves. Of course, I, I support them in this journey. I, I help them solve bigger problems. If they cannot solve the problem, they, they call me. So yeah. I'm part of this, but try not to be a daily part of it, All if, right. if this makes sense. Uh, and of course, as we have two products, each product team has its different, a different mm -hmm. SRE team, so they manage their systems themselves. Uh, of course, if something like fundamental breaks down, like your phone is going to ring. Of course, yeah, yeah, <laughs> multiple times. Yeah, this, this I was I was going to follow up here because you are a global company with two products used uh, all over the world. Mm. I, I suppose the SRE and the support teams are also distributed. They're not entirely in Bulgaria because you cannot cover all time zones. You can, but you won't be as effective working uh, during the night. Yeah, that's also an interesting story because we tr we truly believe that our engineers and product people should be located in the same place so they can have tight interactions with each other. Mm. Even though we, we believe work should be flexible and people should not be at the same location all the time, they should spend quality time together. Yeah. And that's why we, we hired all our engineers in Bulgaria. Uh, and that's that's pretty much and, and the, the SRE teams they're it's a subset from the engineers so they're in Bulgaria as well. All right. Uh, what, what you what you mentioned it's it's kind of a problem and we try to figure this out this this way we we try to lower the maintenance as much as we can so if something happens the system should self heal if if that's possible. All right. So that so, if a bug appears, well there should be some mitigation. Somebody goes there, does the mitigation, and we figure the fix the next day. We we di for for almost nine years now there were like one or two occasions in which that wasn't possible, and we were required to develop a big fix right immediately. All right. Well, that's that's actually an impressive track record, I think. So you, you, your internal process must be like pretty good around quality assurance and deployment. And uh, we can touch on this also later later in the podcast. But yeah, yeah, I suppose if something bad happens, your phone is going to ring, but that's that's just just the nature of just the nature of things. So you mentioned you're doing quite a lot of uh, proof of concepts. C can you give us an example, if possible, and if it's not like confidential, for of some of the latest things that you were uh, researching or trying to prove some some concept? Uh, yeah, sure thing. Uh, one of those is, uh, I, I mentioned the platform engineering thing. Yes. So it's still kind of proof of concept. So we are still working on the first bits and pieces. We are not entirely sure how it's going to work exactly. But I'm really working hands-on on it because uh, we are trying to figure it out. Once we, once we do, I will probably just be reviewing code and... Uh, have consulting uh, role in this, but now I'm hands-on because we need to figure it out. So I'll put this on the list. Uh, 
what was what was the other thing I've been working on? Ah, yeah, we we decided that we'll be starting working on um, the separate services. All so right. up until now, uh, our products were more or less, uh, you know, monolithic applications because it's easier. Of course, it's very easy to just push some code into some repository and deploy it somewhere, and mm -hmm. it works. That's amazing, but it uh, it started to cause uh, troubles like. When when the thing is too big and you add code, it could break everywhere. So that's that's one thing. Another one is, okay, you can horizontally scale a monolith. That's that's great. But when there is a performance issue, it's very hard to catch it because it's a monolith. You you don't know which of the uh, one thousand endpoints had uh, is causing performance issues. Of course you can, but it's very hard. You you have to dig a lot. Yep. So we we have issues like this, and because of that, we we decided okay that's that's very hard to maintain we need to start splitting in some way so i've been doing some pocs how how you create a separate service how you connect it to the rest how you communicate with it how do you deploy it things like that it's partially connected with the with the platform you you can see that but it's also in focus on the on the code splitting part inside the the, the product and working with the teams to adopt these strategies i've 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 figured out during the process also trying to to build some POCs of common libraries because mm, mm, this way you have a lot of stuff that is the same. You repeated code. You don't want to do repeated code, right? Don't repeat yourself. Uh, so we've started building some smaller libraries uh, so we don't repeat code, but just use it as libraries among the services. Do, do you extract code that's more of a framework or that's more of a domain? Uh, framework. Framework. Yeah. yeah. The domain code should be service, not uh, library. You know. <laughs> yeah. well, so, so, some folks uh, really like to, if they see something repeating, they like to extract it. Uh, but uh, thank you for mentioning this. Uh, nine years uh, in the making, a global company, and you're right now approaching uh, services. Yeah. Uh, and I think this this is a great lesson for. Um, all the folks out there that want to start with services right away. And we've had clients like this and we did our best to convince them otherwise that mm. with a team of three, you cannot be running five uh, separate services. <laughs> it's uh, all, all the effort is going to go into platform engineering and uh, figuring out abstractions around the services and you will build nothing but, you know, uh, the hype The hype is still there around uh, microservices and Stuff like this. It's it's good uh, that you mentioned this because we are not building microservices. We are building services. Like the whole product has become huge. Mm. It has more than twenty domains now, and you don't want this into into a single piece of software. But you, yep. if you have if you have like one or two domains, you don't want ten services, right? Yep. So microservices is something that is forbidden. <laughs> <laughs> we we do not do microservices. We do services. And try to keep them decently sized. Uh, some things make sense to be very, very small because they need to be very, very stable and uh, nobody should be touching them at all. Mm. So those will be micro. micro but all the, all the business logic, all the customer processes and things, they, they're interconnected. And if you try to split them uh, and make them minimal, which is, which is amazing, but it creates a lot of overhead because yeah. you end up with a huge amount of services. Yeah, I completely agree. You know, we 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 are constantly pushing against this because uh, sometimes we're working with with startups that are just like, hey, let's uh, we have credits from AWS, let's go crazy. Oh. Yeah, like, um, and we had this great article by Facebook how they are doing like m microservices. Let's, yeah. let's do the same, for example. Let's mm -hmm. do a Chaos Monkey implementation because <laughs> Netflix are doing it. Uh, oh well, that's great to be honest because uh, sometimes what happens is uh, something really unexpected happens and we find that we have a book and we've never knew that there is this book until it causes a downtime. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah, it's it needs to be very uh, well uh, well thought through because you you otherwise you're wasting your time. And as a startup, I, I should say we try to be very mindful about our time because that's our most precious resource, right? Yeah. And our goal is to serve the customers and to help them grow themselves and making sure that we are like, uh, we, we have five nines, it won't help them grow, mm. right? Mm. They, they, of course, they need some stability and reliability, but it, it needs to be into certain levels. 
yeah, was, you need to figure out the balance. And so mm. I completely agree with what you say. And yeah. speaking of, of technology, I remember uh, that uh, nine years ago, you started with the mean stack, mm. which was uh, Mongo, Angular, Node, and Express, yeah, the E is for Express. Uh, are you still running with the mean stack? Uh, it's a little bit sad in some points because it still has day in the stack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah I'll, I'll be more specific here. Uh, we are still running on uh, Node uh, and uh, our database is still Mongo. Our front end though is a little bit more uh, different. All right. it's, it's a little bit different. So we have React uh, now. So all new applications are written in React. We have mobile app written in React Native. And we have some front ends written in Angular JS, and that's that's what I'm sad about. Yeah, because they're they're quite big big applications and takes a lot of time to to rewrite them. We we have started this process; it just takes ages to do. Mm -hmm. And because it doesn't deliver any value to the customers, it's very hard to you know t get some more priority of it as well. But we have it; uh, we have it going. Uh, so it's not mean anymore. It has a little bit more letters here and there. <laughs> <laughs> mean with React. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 a very good stack, to be honest. We, we had uh, this conversation with a new colleague that started about two, two months ago. Uh, he's actually a friend of mine. We've known uh, each other for, uh, for quite some time, and he decided to join the company. And uh, one of the first questions he asked me when he decided to join was, Okay, uh, are, do do you feel happy with the stake you've chosen? I was, that's that's a very hard question, <laughs> <laughs> and very like deep. <laughs> and uh, it, it 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 was it was going to be my next question. So, do you feel happy with the stack? Do you have any regrets? Uh, yeah, of course I do. And uh, as much as I think about them, I feel like we've made the best choice with the information we had and with the technology we had at the time. Because right now you you have more more choices in terms of technologies. Also, there were some technologies back then that now you know they are viable technologies, mm -hmm. but back then you didn't. So I'm I'm quite I'm quite happy with uh, the stick given the the information and the the technologies that were available back then. And uh, to to be honest, uh, one of the one of the best choices uh, was the database. Which I know you you are going to be surprised because you you like Postgres, uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's a pretty decent database. We do a lot of bad things with it, and it it never failed us. <laughs> All right, yeah, that uh, it's also in the questions about the non-relational database. But nine years, I I suppose it's it makes sense. But you know, are you using Mongo as a relational database? or you're using it as a non-relational database. And this is my first question, and perhaps the follow-up question is, what is the best feature of Mongo that for the last nine years you were really, really happy that you, you stick with it? Yeah, uh, I'll surprise you, but the best feature of Mongo is not that you cannot that you, you can push anything in it. That's not the best feature. That's <laughs> the worst feature. <laughs> the best feature of Mongo is its scalability. It's, it's, it's very, very scalable database. You can do very bad things with it and it will just respond and it's going to respond quickly which is which is amazing and usually not true with with other databases uh so that's that's one of its best features and the worst as i said it's the thing uh why uh, why we chose it and why most people choose it is because it's easy you don't need to migrate schemas and things like that well guys that's not true you you still need to migrate your schemas uh once uh once you start changing things and you still need to have very well-defined schemas. You need to follow them. You need to do all the stuff you have to do in the relational database. MongoDB doesn't help you with this. It just doesn't enforce it, which is okay. But you need to know the schema in your application. Otherwise, it's going to be very messed up very quickly. Did I uh, did I respond? Oh yeah, um, <laughs> I was going to say that even if the database is not enforcing schema like Mongo, you will have schema enforced on the application layer, mm. uh, one way or another. You can explicitly enforce it with some kind of ORM or abstraction, or the product that you're building will implicitly enforce it on you. 
because you will be mm. once you start checking uh, do I have this property or do or if this property or if this property then you're implicitly enforcing some kind of schema in the code and I believe you you are using TypeScript yes uh, most of the backend is written in TypeScript now um, all new stuff is written in TypeScript it's it's enforced we have a lot of old code that we're not touching that often that yeah. is still not rewritten all front-end React applications they're only TypeScript uh, and yeah uh, we TypeScript is much better than the JavaScript yeah. it's still JavaScript to be honest but it's easier for, de for the developers yes that's why I like it so much and it's uh, harder to get into the situation with when you expect something and something else happens yeah of course somebody can put any into whatever they want yeah. to but but yeah it's it's harder you, you have to make it explicit and uh, with JavaScript it's it's always like this so it's very painful how do you manage to prioritize rewriting bits of angular js to to react because i guess this is like the the most painful thing you have a front end framework that's no longer supported and you need to prioritize somehow rewriting things mm. and you spend time on shipping the exact same feature but on different framework well that's that's how we do it we try not to ship the same feature <laughs> okay so you're trying to improve it while rewriting it we try to we, we, we rewrite the features when we need to make major revamp of the feature and and of course it happens slower than to do the revamp in place yeah but still it's worth it because we we need to get rid of the feature uh, with the framework otherwise we will spend probably most uh, probably the same time to just rewrite it and make it the same as to make it better so we decide to combine those things yeah that makes sense of course pms are not happy because <laughs> <laughs> they they would like to uh, things to to happen faster but it's it's an investment in the long run all right Awesome. And uh, I have one more question around the mean stack. Uh, Mongo, you are r using some kind of managed service. Again, if it's confidential, don't answer and we'll cut it. But uh, you're using some kind of managed service or you're managing this uh, yourselves? Yeah, that's that's another story that is in progress. Uh, you, you, you'd imagine that we're working on a lot of things. I, I can, uh, yes. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's that's another thing that we've decided we we are uh, we are tired of doing managing Mongo ourselves. To be honest, MongoDB is very easy to manage, mm. uh, so we've we've stick uh, stick with with this managing MongoDB ourselves for a pretty long time. But we decided it's time for it to go, mm. so we are migrating to MongoDB Atlas right now. All right, uh, which is which is quite a decent service. Uh, we almost migrated uh, one of the uh, one of the products there, uh, and uh, for the rest, we use uh, EC2 instances on which we deploy uh, Docker containers in which we have MongoDB. So we've containerized it because it's easier to manage, but still, it's running on EC2 instances, which is never nice. Yeah, you, you you need to have proper monitoring, and I, I'm not sure how you horizontally scale Mongo. Uh, I have some experience with, for example, Influx, where you just add additional disk space, and it's pretty much that. But if you want to horizontally scale Mongo, you need to be getting more EC2 instances, I suppose, you, or adding more disk space, or you you could you could do that. We've never needed to to actually scale it horizontally because uh, our main load is on the on the primary, which is unfortunate, but yeah. this is how it uh, how it happens to be. Uh, we scaled it like once, <laughs> uh, and we did it vertically. Vertically, all right. Yeah. Okay. Just get a bigger machine. Yeah, just got a bigger machine, but we did it once. It just uh, so amazingly efficient database. You you do whatever you want with it, and it it works without uh, requiring too much hardware. Of course, it depends on the on the on the data amount. We we have a lot of data, but it's not always used. So it caches very efficiently the little data that is used very frequently. So it's it's working quite good, and we we didn't uh, uh, need to scale it horizontally yet. It's it, it's tough because to make it scalable horizontally, you have to do one of two things: either uh, have problem with the reads and put the reads to the secondaries, then you can scale the secondaries, which is uncommon because usually you, when you have troubles, it's not because of so many reads, but because of complicated writes and you need to do reads, but they need to be uh, consistent. Mm. 
So you still read from the primary because secondaries have luck to think. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing you could do is to shard the data. Mm. And this makes sense only when you have a lot of data uh, in terms of your sharding key, yeah. right? And our sharding key would be the account. And the problem usually with the, with the amount of data is not the number of accounts, but the size of a specific account. You have one very big account and a lot of very small accounts, for example. We we, we have a lot of very big accounts. <laughs> okay. Uh, but they're they're very very big. Uh, the good thing is they're distributed around the globe, so they don't uh, use the system at the same time. So we've never needed to actually do the sharding thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's very hard to do it when you host the Mongo on your yourself because mm -hmm. it's a lot of details. And we we've, we've decided, okay, we won't do it. Uh, until we get to Atlas. In Atlas, it's very easy. It's it's a checkbox. You do it, and it starts working, which is which is amazing. That's the, that's why we prefer to use platform as a service. The beauty of hosted services. Oh yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Just a checkbox, and it works. Yeah. And the price. Well. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. You 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 pay for you pay for the service, but that's that's uh, how how it always is, right? We wouldn't be having salaries if if people wouldn't like to, to pay for our services exactly. and for yours. <laughs> yeah. Well, you said that you have clients on different uh, instances. That means that you have, uh, let's say, a Europe instance and then the USA instance. Or how, do you manage multiple instances of the software throughout the globe? Or is it only one? Or how, how you do that? Yeah, you you uh, correctly notice that it's it's a global software, so it needs to have uh, global uh, multiple instances. Uh, the the US customers they use the uh, we have the biggest instances uh, host in Europe, uh, but because Europe and the US are very well connected, uh, they can both use the Europe instance. Uh, the problem is in Asia and mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and with Australia and mm -hmm. New Zealand, so we have two instances: one in Asia Pacific and one in uh, Australia. So uh, people from those regions have can can have good connectivity. So yeah, we have multiple instances, okay. we do. but we don't use it for sharding just yet. Probably we'll have another instance uh, in the US because of this problem, because like half of the customers in Europe, another half are in the US. Mm. Uh, for, from those that are in uh, on the Europe instance, I mean. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the data still stays in Europe, and you're uh, just distributing the application. The, the the every single application instance have its own oh, database. Data, right. Okay. And we we mirror only the accounts across the globe, so all instances know what are all the accounts. Got it. And when you go to your account, it doesn't matter which instance you pick; uh, it's gonna find which is your instance and redirect you there. All right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. And all of this is AWS. Uh, I think we made the implicit suggestion that it's running on AWS, but I suppose it's AWS. Uh. Yeah. 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 We we were thinking about having some servers in the in the garage, but we decided not to. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? I'm joking. Uh, Our garage is too small. Yeah, <laughs> and garages in Sofia are too expensive. That's true, <laughs> <laughs> especially right now. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, we have more we have more technical questions coming, but uh, let's let's make a turn and uh, talk about because you. You were the co-founder. You and Miro started all of this, and I suppose you and Miro, and most pro and uh, from a certain point, most probably only you, uh, were involved in hiring people. So I I believe you've made a lot of interviews and a lot of the hiring decisions. So can you can you tell us about the key hiring decisions that you made and how how did you find those people? Yeah, I'll start with fi finding the people because that's that's interesting. Uh, we figured that uh, most of the important hires we've made uh, have been have been done through referrals and we've either known the people or somebody in the team known has known the people uh, so that's we figured that's the best way to to hire it doesn't scale well though <laughs> why <laughs> yeah, well you 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 that's that's interesting but uh all the people you know most of the people they know you know them as well <laughs> uh, which is very unfortunate. Mm. So the the uh, social network is uh, kind of a, you know, yeah, uh, lim limited. It, it's very limited approach, and it's uh, very kind of circles that that are 
touching themselves, but they aren't like overlapping comp uh, enough to so, so you can extend the the reach very well. But it helped uh, uh, to to find people that were like minded and that that were seeing the world the same way we do, which is very very important, especially in the early days when things are very very hard and you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, and yeah. Uh, we also found another good source of talent to be the the Telerik Academy, yep. uh, probably because their values overlap with ours pretty much. So they the people they select to get into their programs, they usually become very good fit in in our company as well. But that's a way to to hire junior developers usually. When you need to hire somebody more experienced, we yeah you need to you, it's a different approach I believe. Yeah. But I believe you, you also hired a lot of people from Telerik because uh, the acquisition happened again around that time a when little, you were starting uh, with Office R&D. Yeah, a little bit before we started with Office R&D. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that was the reason but uh, or, or because we knew the people <laughs> and we knew their values and knew how they worked and they knew us and decided to, you know, give us some credit and join because that's you know, it's not us selecting the people, but people selecting us as well. Yeah. So it's complicated. Also, also. Uh, so it's complicated. Uh, of course, probably it is connected because when a company gets acquired, it, a lot of changes happen and sometimes people aren't super happy with those changes and they decide to move on. So probably we had some luck with that. Uh, kind of, but yeah. Yeah, I have a theory about this. Whenever a company gets acquired, the only thing that remains the same is the name. And after a certain period of time, even the name changes. Mm -hmm. So for me, a company getting acquired is basically starting all over, perhaps new values, perhaps new ways of doing things. And uh, this will most certainly make people leave, which is not always a bad thing because then those people can go and join other companies and build things that they actually like and that they find valuable. So, uh, And build a lot of successful startups. Yeah, and yeah. build a lot of successful startups. Yeah, to be, to, to be honest, that's, that's kind of circle of life. So <laughs> sometimes companies need to... Um, to, to let their more most experienced people go uh, so they they can pursue other other things uh, and they can just uh, once a company becomes you know established company uh, it should be doing other things like teaching juniors and yep. uh, uh, teaching new managers and things like that so it's it's important to to have this in mind you cannot keep somebody forever because when they learn stuff, they need to move on and do something else. Yeah, sometimes the 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 best way to see what you've learned is to apply it someplace else. Hmm. Uh, for for some people, but yeah, that this it it happens. But I'm curious, are you a fan of having more interview rounds, especially when you are hiring early, or rather, you you feel the vibe of the person and then uh, give that person a chance? give him or her a chance and see if it's going to stick or not. Yeah, that's that's a very good question because I'm I'm a big fan of not wasting anybody's time in endless interviews. And usually when you have a honest conversation with somebody, it's very easy to figure out their their values, to figure out uh, their skill even because when they tell you about uh, what they've done before and in it depends if you get into details, you understand if they understand what they're talking about or not. Uh, and uh, to, to figure out, uh, do they do, do you like them or not? And they to figure out, do they like you or not? Because that's also important. That's very important as well. Uh, and usually when I'm having an interview, I'm I'm trying to leave it at least 20 minutes uh, to, to give time to the, to the person that came to interview to ask me questions so they can learn more about the company, about the culture, about whatever they want to. Uh, so it's, I'm I'm trying to do it this way and I don't like many interviews but if there are a lot of people that need to see the person it needs to be more than one round because I don't, I'm not a big fan of having like three or four interviewers interviewing one person it, it feels like they're in a very uh, it, it's not equivalent position it's right it's not balanced yet. it's not balanced and it feels like um, you, you are uh, as a, as a person coming to the interview, 
you, you don't feel so welcomed because there are so many people asking questions from here and from here. It doesn't feel good. So we try to, to make interviews two-on-one. All right. So if somebody is leading the conversation, there is a backup so they can so we can switch over, but not more than that. And if there is a third person that want, that needs to see the the new the new person, we make another interview. It could be a very short one over the phone or something. Uh, but yeah, we, we try to do it this way. Uh, and if we need to find some technical details about the skills of the person, uh, we try to give them task or something like this, but it's a separate thing. It's not an interview. It's something else. Either homework, either life one, but it's it's separate thing. So we try to keep it simple. This has a bad side though. It's, it's easier to make a mistake this way. And if you make a mistake and hire somebody... Uh, that is not a good fit. It's bad for everybody. I just wanted to say thank you for watching Hackcast. It means a lot to us. We are doing all of this because we want to provide value to you, our viewers and our subscribers. We hope that you find the conversations that we're having with our guests interesting and you will continue watching Hackcast. Of course, now we have a very specific goal to get to a thousand subscribers. And in order to say thank you to uh, our thousand subscribers, we will pick one of you once we get there and send this beautiful Das Keyboard 6 Professional. It's a very good keyboard. It's a professional keyboard. And we uh, really, really, really want to send this keyboard to someone. So if you are not subscribed to our channel, please subscribe and we will continue making valuable content for you. Thank you. And um, to finish to finish the topic about recruitment, uh, Miro, you mentioned that you want to make a short summary before we continue with our things. Yeah, to sum it up, uh, I, I believe the, the most important thing we've learned in, in this journey, especially about hiring, is that it's very important to know a lot of people and to have a lot of people in your network because that's the, the biggest resource probably you have in terms of hiring. Uh, because those are people you know and those are people that know you and you, if you are in the same network, there there is very good probability that you share some common values as well. So it's and and that's probably the most important thing uh, when when you hire somebody, right? To to know each other and to trust each other and to have have same values, uh, all the the expertise and all of those stuff. Well, they uh, they will probably be there, and, but but if you don't trust each other and cannot work with each other, that's that's a deal breaker. So yeah, that's yeah. that's my summary on this. It's important to it's important to have a good network and to do networking and to see and to go out with uh, and talk with people. So uh, make sure make sure to do this. Now before we continue, uh, and Divo has a very interesting question that we're going to discuss in a minute. But you know it's time about the keyboard because we haven't gotten to a thousand subscribers yet. We are I think past eight hundred. Yes, we're we are very very close. Thank you very much for to to the new subscribers. And once we get to a thousand subscribers. We're going to pick one of the thousand and send this beautiful Das Keyboard 6 Professional. Ivo? It's a great keyboard. I love it. I hope that you're going to enjoy it too. So like, subscribe, and, and... if you enjoy the hackcast, share it with, with other people. Yeah. And uh, yeah. yeah, Miro, are you are you a keyboard geek? What's the keyboard that you're using? I'm I'm a kind of a practical person, so I I do have a special keyboard, but it's not because I'm a geek. <laughs> it's it's because my my wrist hurts sometimes. Uh, so I've, I I bought an ergonomical keyboard. I use the uh, Logitech Ergo K860, if yeah. I'm not wrong. So it's it's a it's nice keyboard, um, and it's nice to to write on it. But I'm not a geek with it in in any way. It just uh, feels good on my wrists. Of course, I'm very often uh, writing code or emails somewhere that is not a desk. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you cannot use a proper yeah. keyboard in those cases. I just use my uh, MacBook, MacBook keyboard, which is decent. It's not very nice for the wrist, but it's 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 okay. Gets the job done. It All gets right. the job done, yeah. But it's not clicking. It, 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 it's silent. Yeah, yeah, my my uh, Logitech keyboard is silent as well, and that's that's good. I I hate clicking keyboards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, all right, okay. Can you walk us through 
designing and implementing a new feature in the in the system. Let's say someone has an idea, hey, it would be really nice to have this in this feature, or you receive some feedback from customers. What what's the process? How how do you develop it? That's that's very interesting to come from you because you've done that yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, uh, so how how the whole thing works? So in the big in the beginning, it all started with a customer coming to us and saying, "Hey guys, you have great product. It saves so much time, uh, but you know it's missing this." And we say, "Okay, tell me more about this. Uh, why would you like us to solve this problem?" Uh, and things like that to understand the whole story. Then we. Uh, create a story in our Jira, which is usually one sentence. Customer A needs to do this because of this. That's all. <laughs> okay. And some developer gets it and tries to understand it. They usually don't. So they speak with the customer again. <laughs> and uh, they write some code and they ship it. And we write to the customer and they say, great, guys, this is this is brilliant. Now it's more complicated be because we have more than 1,500 customers. Wow. Uh, yeah, so we, we cannot do it this way anymore. And usually if you listen to every every single person that wants something, they want far too many things. We, we just cannot do all of them. We wish we could because we love all of our customers and we really want to do all the features they want to, but we just can't. Uh, so what we do right now is we try to, to understand uh, uh, and group all, all the requests we've been having from everybody try to group them together and to see which is the bigger group and try to and, and create those epics in Jira. Now we don't create just stories, we create epics. Okay. Uh, we write the whole story around it. It's usually uh, it's it's usually a whole flow in the system that needs to improve or needs to be to to be created. Uh, because it's it doesn't exist at this point. This happens very uh, rarely right now because we have a lot of features already. Uh, and uh, those things, we try to enrich them and to make them mature and speak to other customers to see. Because it could be something that like 10 people have reported to us that is missing, but it's actually something that will affect positively everybody. Mm. So we try to figure this out as well, how many people will be positively affected by this. And with this thing, it, it matures over time. We, and we try to prioritize them and try to create uh, uh, at least several of those every quarter All right. to, to make people happy and to improve their life. Uh, also, we, we have another way to, to you know, pick, uh, pick out uh, features to be created. We call those the vision bucket. <laughs> Uh, so those are things we believe that will be very useful for the for the whole customer base, but it's not something they need right now. It's something that we know they'll need by the time we, we develop it. So those are things we see and we believe they don't see yet. Uh, of course, we try not to do too many of those because those are long shots usually. <laughs> Um, and we try to uh, understand w once we have the idea and uh, we we know what's the flow, what's the purpose of this, we we start talking to people again. We try to collect more and more information, what problems we believe there are. We try to validate those to see if they are real or we imagine them, how big of a problem they are. It's like it's like when starting a company, uh, you you don't you, you believe there is a problem, but you're not sure, so you have to validate this. Yep. So this is uh, th this have more validation work because it didn't came from customers. Uh, so once we figure out what we have to do, because I, I can speak about this uh, a lot, but it's more on the product side, and I'm aware we are uh, uh, more of a engineering kind of podcast and not a product podcast, even though all engineers are. Uh, a little bit of product people as well. So we try to cover both both sides. So oh, no worries. okay. So it's good. Uh, I'm. I hope it's interesting for for all the people listening. Uh, so let's get to the engineering part. Once once those features are kind of described in Jira, they come uh, they they come to the team and they do these refinement sessions where they speak, uh, they read the story, they try to understand it, they ask questions to the product people, they try to figure it out, to, to describe it in more details, to take some product decisions, how, how this is going to be implemented, because, of course, product people will describe what the problem is, and probably 
how it's how it's solved, but it might not be. The solution might not be there. Yeah. So uh, they try to figure out what's the final solution, what's what's the complete picture of this, how how it's going to look like, how it's going to work, and try to create stories out of it. And those stories, Jira stories, uh, they they contain uh, we we call those the scope of the story. So All right. It, so it's the description of the feature, how it's going to work and things like that, while the story itself and the problem is it solves, it, it's in the in the epic. So you can always go to the epic and understand the, the context of what you're building right now. So so the engineers are taking the epics, refining them and turning them into stories. With, with the product, with the product managers. With the product managers, yeah. but still stories include... Uh, a higher level description of what we're trying to achieve and not some specific low-level implementation de details. It might contain low-level de implementation details. It depends on the engineers. All right. It's 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 actually that's uh, that's a place where engineering teams have the freedom to to okay. choose how well defined it should be. Because if you think about it, the refinement session is definition by committee. So you have mm -hmm. a committee mm -hmm. and you make the definition. So they may, may decide to do it together or they may, may decide to leave it to the person implementing the story, working with the product manager. Still, the final word is uh, said by the product manager because he understands the whole picture. Uh, but uh, the, the engineer working on the task might, might have the freedom to take their own decisions and work with the product manager to see if they're good enough or not. Yeah. Or they can decide it together as a team. So it's it's up to the team. We have like six, uh, no, five teams now. So every team is different. So five teams. So I, I believe uh, those are per domain, or 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 they kind of collectively work on a, a couple of domains together. But the entire team takes care of this part of the system. It's yeah. I'll, I'll start with this. We we have two products now. So yep. one one of the products is our Flex product, which is for co-working managing co-working space businesses. Mm. Uh, this product has three engineering teams working on it. We have uh, our hybrid work solution, which allows companies like yours to uh, manage their space in a way and, and their flexible way of working in a way that allows them uh, to, to, to have less space than the people so they can optimize space, but also allow people to, uh, to, to organize the process of booking their, their visit to the office because yeah, it's I can talk about uh, what yeah. about this, but I won't get into. If we have a hundred people and uh, fifty yeah. uh, desks, we need to use your product to effectively yeah. organize uh, the way we work and who's going to be in the office when and uh, which desk is going to be used. If I can summarize it somehow, this one of the products. That's part of the story, but yeah, yeah uh, we can say if you have fifty desks and hundred people, you have to use our software. You you don't have a chance. If you have one hundred desks and one hundred people, you better and you have hybrid work policy. So people should come to the office, mm -hmm. but they are not uh, forced to every single day. You you still do not need our uh, software because otherwise people will come to the office and, at random and they won't interact with each other effectively, and there will be no point of them coming to the office at all. So I would say that. If you have hybrid work policy in the company mm. and people are not every day in the office or every day, you know, somewhere, uh, so if they are not 100% remote or if they are not 100% uh, on 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 the in, in the office, they sh you should be using uh, our hybrid solution. But I don't want to get into so much detail. No, no, no worries for everyone listening. Uh, if you if your company has a hybrid uh, work policy. And you're not using uh, Office R&D software or something similar. Make sure to check Office R&D software because it might actually help you do a better job and help you improve the work culture in the company. So thank you for mentioning this. Yeah, thank you. So uh, we we have one engineering team working on this hybrid solution. All right. So it's four, and we have a platform team which is working on the platform that everybody is building on top of it. So we have five teams, and they work in a different way. For instance, the platform team doesn't have product managers. It's uh, it's me and our CTO, the product managers. Uh, the other teams, they, they have product managers in their domains. They're split by domains as well. So in the Flex, where there are th three teams, they have every single one has a set of domains. So they work on different domains. And uh, and yeah, uh, every single team, they do refinement themselves. So they, they have some stories uh, ready to be developed. They start refining them to to prepare them for actual development, 
and they they figure out the detail they want to get the the stories done too before they start but it's 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 up to the team so every single team have its own dynamics and their own preferences and of course if they uh, refine the story very well they'll spend more time uh, up front mm. but after that it's going to be faster uh, and if they don't do that and they need to do it uh, on the spot they'll need the product managers because they'll need to ask him questions during yeah. the yeah. during the work which which might not be very suitable in some cases at which point are you releasing the feature to production the earliest possible or you're waiting for it to be like a mature feature and then release it and how you bring it to the customers actually out answer with a question how how do you know some feature is a mature feature if you if you've never released it well yeah <laughs> that's a good question but yeah we've seen a lot of features be like overdeveloped on different projects uh, and being shipped to production like way after they are an mvp so yeah. what's your approach there? Yeah, we, we, we try to to build smaller features to ship them to production and to, uh, if they are not suitable for the end customers to see them or not all of them, we try to put them in under feature toggles. So we ship part features, we combine them together and we undo the toggle so they can see it. Sometimes we, we, uh, we try to build something bigger and then ship it. Uh, this never been a good idea because... The, there are a lot of people writing code and so when the code changes, you need to uh, resolve conflicts and things like that. Bugs appear. And also, I believe the biggest problem with this is that you are thinking, okay, I'll be developing on this the next three months. This is not a way to keep uh, keep people uh, in, in this momentum and mm, mm. They, they, they lose focus, they lose... Uh, uh, I wouldn't say motivation, but still it, it uh, affects their motivation. If you if you have this thing and you ship it and you get feedback, that's something that you that, that keeps you going. It's it's a very it's a very nice feeling. And if you do something for months and you never release it, that's it, it never feels yeah. good. Even if you don't realize it, it affects you. Of course. And at what point are you including the QAs in the process? Are they taking part from the beginning where the feature is being scoped on when it's done and it needs to be tested? It's very important to note that uh, QAs are part of our engineering teams. So every single engineering team has their own QAs. On, so on these refinement sessions, QAs are there. They're asking questions. They're trying to figure out what should be tested. They they even write uh, uh, scenarios and uh, uh uh, how do they call them? Acceptance criteria. Okay. Uh, so, so they know what is ahead of them as well. So, it's uh, in the final stories. It's not just the the scope, but also the acceptance criteria that the QAs had had written, and they are part of the development uh, all along. Uh, and even with some teams, we try to cover the code with tests. Even, I mean, end to end tests like API tests or UI tests. Uh, while the code is being written, so it, it when when it's time to release it, we already have end-to-end -end tests. It's it's hard. It's very hard to be honest. Uh, but that's that's what we are trying to do because the product is getting bigger and bigger. And if you don't have good coverage with tests, it's very hard to to manually test it at all. It's it's almost impossible to be honest. Right now, yeah. if you do, if something happens with our tests, I wouldn't be feel confident that we can release at all. Makes sense. Okay, last question about the, the, the feature release process. Uh, this whole process seems great for bigger features like epics with multiple multiple stories in there. What about small things? Let's say, what about if you want to add a filter here or just a quick export to a CSV that can even happen in the browser? How do you approach those smaller things in the whole process? Well, to, to know it's a simple filter here or an export to CSV there, to, to, to know that that's the solution, you first have a problem, right? Some customer comes to you and says, hey, you have to create uh, this new module where you you can write uh, uh, commands to chat GPT and it can uh, give you a file uh, where you can, you know, filter and do things in Excel. Yeah. And, and we say, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> you don't need that. Tell me what you want to achieve. And then they start talking and you understand that they actually need an export, right? <laughs> exactly. So, so it's the same process in 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 its nature. It's the same process. It just uh, has fewer stories in it. 
okay. by the end of the day. It will end up as something smaller that will be developed quicker and shipped quicker, basically. But you again need to start with, hey, what are you actually trying to, what do you want to achieve? Yes. This is what you what you have to ask the client. And this is, by the way, um, our, our daily life too, uh, because... Uh, when we work with clients and we usually form teams and we do quite a lot of product work for with our clients mm-hmm. uh we've gotten i i think we're quite a decent product uh, product folks and we are going to do some internal product trainings now but um usually when the client says hey let's uh, let's do something very specific with included implementation details <laughs> this is a big red flag and then you have to take a step back and say hey, what are you trying to achieve what problem are you trying to solve because whenever the clients start pushing technical details at least from our experience this is sometimes it's actually okay some clients want to do this and this is part of the engagement that we're doing with them but most of the times it's like no 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 just mm-hmm. just let's see what what you want to what problem you want to solve and we will take it uh from there so yeah yeah that's that's very important because we've been we've been doing a lot of things that somebody asks us to do and we didn't have time to to dig deeper we just did them <laughs> which is yeah, when when you don't have time to to think and do things without thinking, that's never a good way to save time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but we've done that, that a lot, and it's it's always been a mistake. And do, do you have some kind of a, like an admin panel for uh, the senior folks at the company that can um, manage the feature toggles, like release this feature to this subset of uh, of customers or clients? No, 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 no. <laughs> we don't we don't want uh, those feature flags to be you know switched on for somebody somebody others to be switched off for somebody that's that's not something we want to achieve we want to use them as release toggles mm. so we roll them out we remove them and they're not there anymore so the the feature flags are currently managed by the via the API we will right. probably we will probably put them into some UI at some point uh to, to allow the product managers to actually release stuff yeah because they they know how uh, this should be synced with marketing releases or with different features coming from different teams and uh, so on uh, but we don't want to have multiple feature feature flags living at the same time that's that's something we do not want to have it's 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 very dangerous path to go to. All right, yeah, I, I suppose so. But uh, n- nevertheless, you want to give some kind of control to the folks really doing the final release to like, no, okay, this is now this is now released, not because it was deployed to production, but because we are aligned that it's actually released. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We we do that via API, and right. uh, of course, this forces the PMs to have a, a technical body uh, doing the release, which wastes a little bit of time, but also ensures. Uh, alignment. I think that's more important. Then it's product and uh, engineering or software. They're at least for me, they're quite intertwined. Mm. At the especially on the application application level, uh, you need to be aware what the other side is doing. All right, we have a very interesting question uh, for Miro, which is uh, also aligned with the topic of uh, this episode of Hackcast. Let's imagine the following scenario. Someone comes to you and says, Miro, Miro, uh, I have been invited to become a technical co-founder, a CTO of a promising company. Can you share some uh, experience or what should I be looking for? What's important to know? What are you going to answer to that person? Yeah, I'll answer, run, run like hell. (laughs) <laughs> that was all. Thank you for <laughs> don't go there. Of course, of course, I'm 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 joking. Uh, it it very much depends on the on the person, of course, and their uh, their motivation to to actually join a startup as a technical founder. I would say it's a very hard thing. It's very demanding, uh, and it's very w- with very low probability for success. <laughs> and if you do not understand those, it's a very bad choice for you. You have to understand that you are signing up for something that will be like twice or three times more demanding than your daily job. It's going to be probably very bad paid in the beginning. It could it could have quite good reward in the long run, but in the beginning, it's going to be very bad paid. 
and it's going to be very stressful because there will be a lot of ups and downs and you most probably not get to a very nice result but the 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 great thing about it is you're going to learn a, a ton of stuff not only technical stuff but also you you learn how to to manage products you learn uh, how to do marketing you you learn how to sell you learn how to communicate with people in very stressful situations so all those things that you you're going to to get you, you become a better version of yourself it's it's very demanding and but but at the same time it it's a very good exercise to to learn and to even to learn about yourself and about your true values and things like that which is which is quite interesting so what to answer to this people uh, to this person it, it's going to be it's going to be very much to try to understand what is their motivation to join because if it's to make big money that's a very way a bad way to to <laughs> make money it's a very bad way yeah you you most probably not get money but spend some <laughs> uh yeah and uh, depending on their motivation I'll, I'll try to have them understand uh if that's a good thing or bad thing and of course they'll be not aware of all the pitfalls and all the positive things i'll try to clear them out those things uh to, I, I i had such conversations in the past uh, with, with some friends of mine that uh, have been considering starting companies which is always exciting i i do really want p- to, to see more people starting uh, software businesses, especially especially uh, like uh, startups that uh, raise investments and try to conquer the world. It's, it's very hard, but it's very a uh, good way for people to grow. And as, as I said, the probability is very low to succeed, but if more people start companies, there will be more successful companies, which is great for our uh, country and for our ecosystem. And I do really want to see more people doing it, but to have them more to to have more of them successful, they need to understand what they're signing for. If they don't they're understand, important. they'll probably give up at some point. And I don't want to see uh, people saying, "Oh, that's that was the biggest mistake in my life." Right? I want to to all of them say, "I don't regret a, a day uh, doing this. It it was it was amazing journey." Even though I. I Started three companies and none of them were successful. It was it was the best thing I've ever done. All right, that's uh, uh, that's a good way to put it. You need to be self-aware or be ready to become self-aware. Mm. Uh, it's not a nine to five, by no, no means. No, in any way. you 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 are most probably going to go through multiple burnouts, no matter what you do. I think it's is this it safe to say. Yeah, the the thing with the burnouts is very interesting as well. Uh, there have been a lot of studies, and probably uh, the the theory I'm most aligned with is that the burnouts are not uh, caused by overworking, but they're caused of um, unmatched uh, expectations. Mm. So, so if you if you hoped for something and it never came true, like if your motivation is very misaligned with with the reality. Uh, this is most most often causing burnouts more much more than the uh, overworking. So there are a lot of people that are working a lot and they are not burning out, and that's because their motivation is very much aligned with the with the reality. I I can agree with this, but I think I think this comes at a later point. Initially, if you don't have this experience, you will just burn out by just by getting this new experience and by working a lot because you will not. This is this is my point of view. You will not know how to manage your stress levels and how to recover because mm. you, so far, if you have been working a standard nine to five job, you, you never had the need to know how to properly recover. So All I right. think this this will this will this is also something that people need to be aware that their health might temporarily suffer. But if they become more self-aware and better know how to take care of themselves, uh, I think it's it's a great learning experience with the potential of also uh, making something big. To, to add uh, to your point, uh, I would say something that uh, Miro has always been saying to me, uh, that this is actually a marathon and not a sprint. So you... To, you in order to succeed in in starting a company, especially in a startup, you you have to be very resilient. You you 
you shouldn't be um you, you shouldn't be doing things that you say okay i'll do this now and after that i won't it's not going to work out right to work, yeah. uh so in order to survive and to to be in this 3% i believe is the <laughs> The statistic. It's really how the, it depends on how we define success. Some yeah. people may be successful and profitable, but not make a lot of money for VCs, which for me is also a success for the startup. Uh, it's not necessarily you don't have to necessarily make money for the VCs, but you know, it depends on how you define the success. Well, it, the the success is uh, in the startup world is is the growth. Hmm. So if you, if you have decent growth, you you get VC money probably. <laughs> That's not going to be a problem. Uh, so. We should, we should probably we should uh, split the things into. Right. So we have companies, normal companies, and we have startups. And with the startups, this is what I'm talking about yeah. mostly for startups. For for the normal companies, it's it's different. I I can't say much about it. Probably you guys can because yeah. you've been you've been. We running. are a normal company. We're not a startup. Yeah. 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 yeah you 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 aren't aiming for. Uh, multiples of growth every single year and yeah. things like that uh you're trying to be sustainable and to to make good business to focus on other things you you still have values you have you 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 want to to live by mm. you also have a lot of stressors you have to manage some way mm. and so also hard but it's it's different it's, it's a different so, game yes so what i'm talking about is the startup life which is yeah which is like with with the very low probability for success and things like that but that's that's not a problem at all i mean the the low probability and back to to your point with the success the success in the startup world usually means that uh you you got uh, through this uh this gap uh when you you've got some customers but you you are failing to get the majority of the of the niche you are aiming at uh, the start startup world usually calls this the valley of death. <laughs> <laughs> so if you pass through it, that's that's the success I'm talking about. All right. Then then it's uh, how how big it is. So it's then then it's uh, speak uh, speaking of how big. That's an interesting uh, yeah, uh, and thank you for bringing this. Uh, it's a good idea to differentiate between startups mm. and uh, like businesses. Because startups, their aim is basically to grow because uh, of of the VC investment, and mm. you, you just just want to make it big, uh, and you want to achieve global success. And running a business, you most probably want to achieve sustainability, uh, more or less, uh, rather than constantly growing. You still have to be growing because sometimes sustainability comes from having a, a larger, a bigger business. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you are very small, then something that goes uh, not not as good for you can basically kill you. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's that, that's a, that's an interesting topic, and we should uh, perhaps book. Uh, future hackcast episode and uh, talk about this and just to finish this topic let's say again hypothetically uh in a couple of years uh things for office r d go really really well and you you guys uh, do an exit mm -hmm. are you willing right now from this position to uh try again with a different company like start a different company that's a that's very interesting uh, question as well uh, and you're making a good exit like you're you are yeah. making good money yeah definitely the first thing i'll do is i'll book some rest <laughs> 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 it's 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 been a rough uh, rough ride so far i as i said i i i don't regret it a bit but it's been mm. it's been tough and it's going to be even tougher because we're quite big now and we need to still be growing which is even harder um but uh yeah to, my my answer is i'll probably get some rest and see what happens after that mm -hmm. but i know myself and i know that i'll probably try you'll another. probably do it again yeah <laughs> awesome that's this is uh... it, it's something that that uh, my wife shouldn't be shouldn't be listening to she wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't like it <laughs> yeah but this again comes to self-awareness and it's good to have this kind of self-awareness that you know that you're most probably going to do it again but like do it you know in a smarter way i believe 
Mm, yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. We've we've learned so much that it's going to be in a smarter way, mm. definitely. But as as always with the, with the startups, there is a big portion of luck as well. It's not just not doing the right things, but also doing them at the right time. And oh yeah, and timing things is very very hard. You know, if you don't have a crystal ball. Oh, look plays a big if look plays a big part. And I mean, this is a realization that I had recently, and then I'm now self-aware with it and kind of okay with it because whatever you do, uh, sometimes you just won't be lucky enough, or sometimes you will be lucky enough in order to to achieve success. And to uh, and to finish the topic about luck, uh, something that uh, at least for me uh, recently I kind of uh, made peace with uh, the fact that sometimes you will just be unlucky, and sometimes you will just be lucky, and you have no control over this particular situation. Yet, if you decide to do nothing or not to do enough because, oh, I might be unlucky, I think this is not a good strategy. Mm. And I think Miro will agree with me. Yeah, definitely. I've, I've, uh, most of my life, I've never been uh, very, uh, uh, very, very thinking about luck uh, mm. the, the way I should be. I've been thinking, okay, it doesn't matter. You just work hard towards what you decided and you get it. But that's not the reality in we live in. Mm. Uh, you, Luck is very important part of whatever you you want to do, but luck doesn't matter if you don't chase your goals very very hard. Um, I I remember listening to some book. I I don't remember the name unfortunately. That's that's my bet. But I remember uh, the the author uh, telling about uh, some some experiments they've made with uh, with some uh, imaginary actors. So like all right. They, they they make them like uh, battle cards, so every person have different skills, and they create a lot of records. They generate a lot of records, and they make them with different skill levels, and they uh, put them into a system which uh, which gives them a little bit of bonus in every skill level uh, based on luck. All right, and they put them in uh, through through a simulation of of uh, uh, battling them together, right? Mm -hmm. And they find, found out that none of the top performers were bad at their skills, but all of them had like extremely high levels of luck. Mm -hmm. So, and and this was this was the the um, the, the story that uh, actually, even though uh, look, even though it's it's all hard work, it's not only this. If you don't work hard and develop your skills, you won't have. Uh, the luxury uh, of depending on luck. Yes. But if you depend on uh, only on luck, yeah, you, you won't have the chance to do anything. But if, if you work hard and you have a lot of luck, you, you'll be very successful. Of course, if you if you are very bad at luck, which is not your fault. Sometimes it happens. <laughs> yeah. And it you, happens you just, to everyone. You, you just have to accept it. This all means that all, all, all people that... Uh, that have their successes in life, they should be very thankful for this. It's not only because of the the people around them that help them grow, not only because their hard work that uh, help them develop their skills as well, but also because of a bit of luck. Very well said. Very well said. I completely agree with this. If if you do nothing and you get lucky, you won't be able to understand that you are currently uh, getting lucky. Or this is, uh, uh, and you won't be able to cap capitalize on this. While if you do stuff and you network and you kind of broaden your funnel of things, then uh, you will most probably be able to understand that right now uh, it's a lucky moment and you can capitalize on it. Like, I mean, this is this is for me. You'll be ready for the luck. Yeah, that's that's a very good good thought. That you have to be ready for the luck. You you just cannot uh, sit on the couch and wait for the luck to come. Yeah, you you ha you have to be constantly doing something in some direction, but this this comes with time. And to finish all of this, uh, there is a topic that we are including in every episode so far, because it's an uh, interesting and uh, also quite how to say, existential topic, mm. and is the topic of AI. So let's start with the more uh, practical stuff. Uh, are are you personally currently using any of the modern AI tools in your day-to-day -day job? 
Of course I am. <laughs> Everybody is. What are you using? How are you using them? Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. I'm uh, f- first of all, I'm very big believer in technology, and that technology is helping make our lives better, uh, better, and to improve our effect on the world around us, which is very important. Every every one of us, one of us wants to make the world better, right? Yes. And to you, you need some amplifiers, and with today's world, the technology is amplifying your impact very, very much. And AI is not different in this in this part. It it amplifies you a lot. Of course, if you do bad things, it's gonna amplify the bad things. If you yep. do good things, it's gonna amplify <laughs> the good things. So we have to be mindful with 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 the AI because it's gonna amplify us. Uh, and what I'm using, I'm using uh, Copilot because right. it's it's very very well integrated into Visual Studio Code. If I want to ask some question, I can I can do it. So you can prompt do the prompts with it, and it's context aware. It's it's amazing. Mm-hmm. I also use ChatGPT uh, to 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 make conversations with myself. <laughs> All right. It, it helps with this. It's uh, otherwise people don't look very well at you when you talk to yourself. <laughs> but when you when you speak with AI it's better. <laughs> uh it's it, it's uh, it's a very good tool. Basically uh, you know Copilot is ChatGPT underneath so it's basically the same thing. Yeah. Uh so yeah that's that's what I'm using. How do I use it? Well, in most cases, when I write code, Copilot is just continuing my my sentences, you know, in a way, and it usually guesses my my thoughts very well. I always read what it generates because sometimes it generates bullshit. Uh, so yeah, that's that's something to for for our listeners who are not writing code for twenty years, be careful with AI. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's uh, if it knows uh, how to code better than you 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 have to probably first learn how to code better than the AI and then start using it um and uh, chatgpt i usually use it to research topics i'm not super well aware of uh, it's it's very good in giving you overviews and to giving you direction what to read what to check out things like that it's very good at that because it it you know knows a lot of stuff it's not very good into giving you specific solutions. That's what co- Copilot is better at. <laughs> yes, because it has the context. Uh, but I I use it to to research bigger topics and to see okay what are the top ten frameworks to do that. Okay, and then I go and treat over the internet. It helps a lot with this. So, so sounds good. And uh, we we had this discussion in our first episode with Doncho about the practical use of modern AI in software development. And uh, the thing about Copilot is it keeps you in flow. You are coding, mm. you are in flow, and it just like goes to right things. That if you are having a good structure and using good types, it can infer uh, much better than just uh, if you are trying to write something that you don't know what is going to, the answer is going to be uh, like. And uh, yeah, ChatGPT is also great for starting a research. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's not very good at specifics, but mm-hmm. then you can just Google for specifics. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, can, yeah. it can help you Google for the specifics exactly. as well. Learn, learn the vocab learn the vocabulary of a topic that you don't know much about mm. so you can then start you can um, start googling more specific things and uh, don't get the full page of ads because if you google too generic <laughs> you're getting just ads and, uh, no, not a good thing and do you have a company policy at office R&D yes we do uh, security is very important for us because uh, we want to keep our uh, customers in a, in a situation where they don't need to worry about this. So we are very focused on this. And because of that, uh, one of the policies is no no uh, user data is ever sent to AIs. Uh, and the other one is we do not share our company code with ChatGPT because of their no unclear policy about what do they do with the prompts. Uh, we, we do share it with Copilot because we already share it with with, with GitHub, with GitHub, so we we, we can't avoid this. Uh, but uh, we we try to to w- when using ChatGPT, we try to m- use it for more generic things. And if it's something very specific, we shouldn't be pasting the company code there. <laughs> well said. And I think we have we have the same policy here. Like you don't paste clients' code in ChatGPT, like never. 
Mm. But we have uh, company wide. We're using GitHub Business. We have company wide Copilot accounts for everyone, and uh, it's really it's re- it's a good tool. It's really useful tool. The Copiloting ChatGPT. Yeah. Yeah. If you're using three point five, it t- right today. Um, because I'm using the f- for um, subs- subscription version, and right now you cannot get yourself subscribed to ChatGPT because we are recording this uh, around the uh, drama OpenAI AI uh, CEOs being fired and rehired and so on. Uh, and right now you cannot get the subscription because of too many users. And uh, one of our folks were, was using 3.5, and the answers were horrific like really bad. Then I pasted the same prompt, pasted the response, the, ans- the answers were straight on and exactly what uh, this particular person was looking for. So... Yeah, it's much better. Much better. It's much better. Uh, but even if it's better, it's still, still response stupid things. So if you, if you are not super familiar with the topic you're working on, be mindful about it mm-hmm. and check your facts. Don't rely on the, on the AI. It might be it might be very, very clever and gives you very well respo- uh, very well rounded responses and sound like a professional, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's so that's a good uh, good thing to be mindful about. Uh, and do you think AI uh, and the future versions of whatever is coming will replace us? It's first very- as software engineers and then second as humans. Yeah, that's that's a very complex co- question and very existential, as you said in the beginning. It's uh, a topic that a lot of people are talking about. And my my thought about this is, first of all, as I said, it's amplifying ourselves. And as it's amplifying humans, ampli- amplified humans with AI will replace some of the software engineers first. Uh, at some point, probably it's going to replace us all together, but that's not specific for the software engineers. It's going to be for yes. everybody. Uh, is it going to be no need from humans anymore? If you if you think about the past, because it's not the first technolo- technical revolution that is happening, right? It's like the third, probably. <laughs> depends on how you count them, but yeah. Yeah, it depends on how how you count them. But it's, it's not the first revolution that happens. And w- what usually happens is people find different things to do, right? That the machines couldn't do for them. Uh, I doubt there will be no room for this in the world, uh, but it's going to be very dramatic because a lot of people will need will be replaced and displaced, and that's going to be very, very soon because I, I can see it happening. The new uh, chat GPTs and things like that, they, they amplify people so much that a lot of companies will decide not to hire new people anymore. So what happens with the with, with the new generation? How do they learn? How do they become professionals if nobody wants to hire them because companies amplify their current stuff? So that that's going to be very very painful for the whole for for the whole humanity. And then and that's not going to be very far away. Uh the whole whole industries will be taken over by machines, which is going to be even more painful. Um, but we'll find another things to do and more creative and yeah and let's hope it's not killing ourselves <laughs> well yeah because AI is amplifying ourselves and that's and amplification can be even mm. either good good or bad and we are in the driving seat it could amplify us in a very bad way you're right mm. so somebody with AI could decide to kill all humanity and if they if this person has the best AI he'll probably achieve it so that's that's yeah. dangerous <laughs> And to to be honest, I believe that's more uh, probable to happen than the AI itself to decide to kill us because it doesn't care, right? It's a model. I mean, why why should the model kill us? <laughs> well, because the model listens to the user and the user decides to do that. That's exactly. that's it. Yeah. Well, we'll see. That's in like interesting times to to live in. And yeah, I I think yeah. no, nobody knows there there are arguments for uh, a, a doom scenario, and there are arguments that uh, what we have right now is on top of the curve, and we won't be getting much more from what we have right now. 
uh, it's just like tools on top of tools that kind of can do so, some specific work better. But uh, we'll see. Uh, hopefully, Hackast will be here and <laughs> we will continue discussing uh, further this topic. Or we'll be replaced by AIs talking to each other. I don't know. Ah, uh, no. <laughs> uh, we'll keep it human. And to end with the human side of things, uh, this is the, the other question that we ask all of our uh, guests. How do you rest? How do you recharge? Because your job is quite stressful, mm -hmm. as we discussed, so how do you deal with that? If you ask Miro, he'll answer that I write God to rest. <laughs> <laughs> of course, that's not true, but it's a good joke. Um, I like sports, even though I don't look like one. Uh, uh, like uh, going going out, doing snowboarding, going, doing tracking, uh, things like that. Uh, also, I like traveling a lot, and probably part of the traveling is tasting different foods and things like that. And that's why I look like that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I do like traveling and learning new new stuff. Uh, and yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Because of that, I, I read books, I uh, listen to podcasts. So Doing more human activities, like that's quite important. Mm, yeah. Playing with AI is also something I do uh, in my in my free time, but try not to, to do it that much. All right. Well, Miro, thank you very much. It's, it was a pleasure talking to you. I think we touched upon a lot of uh, interesting topics. There is still plenty to discuss, and most probably we can we can have. Uh, additional uh, we can record more episodes in the future if we are still here and AI has not taken over uh, but yeah thank you for thank you for participating thanks for having me guys it was a pleasure for me as well and yeah hope we'll get into the studio once again yeah and uh, Ivo will close this episode like subscribe and share with your friends you're aiming for 1000 subscribers am I missing something? And remain human. Remain human. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.